everyone. I decided to re-record uh, the last insulin support group presentation, which is Dr. Michael Bliss, The Discovery of Insulin. It was originally recorded in 2007. Um, and just because it was a little choppy, I just re-recorded it. I like to thank Dr. Michael Bliss for that presentation. It was supposed to be used primarily for support groups, which we're doing. If he has any problems with it, I will happily take it down. But uh, without further ado, please enjoy the presentation and documentary behind uh, back when they didn't have insulin, uh, what they did to keep people alive, and the dramatic effects of once they started receiving insulin. So, hope you guys enjoy. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye. It's tough to live with diabetes. We all know that. But I'll tell you stories diabetes when it was really tough, which was before there was insulin. And then I'll tell you what it was like for people with diabetes when insulin came. And when I'm finished, you'll know a little bit of history. You'll have met some very neat people. And you'll remember why you're in this business and how maybe it things could be a lot worse and you'll also appreciate the wonderful stories that the next in a way the next generation after I've talked about people like Kathy uh, have and the inspiration that that they can give I'm just going a little bit back further it was like for people to become diabetic when in the years before there was insulin and the answer, of course, isn't pleasant because when there was no insulin, type 1 or juvenile diabetics seldom survived more than a year or two after the onset of their diabetes. They lost weight rapidly, suffered many other complications, and then usually slipped into half consciousness and then coma. And when they went into coma, you uh, alerted the undertaker because uh, they didn't recover. Uh, of, of diabetes. In the 19th century, it was sometimes reasoned that if they were passing sugar in their urine, maybe you should give them more sugar to make up for what they were losing. It's not a good idea. Uh, disastrous therapy. By the 20th century, you often just fed them opiates, which at least dulled the senses. There were, of course, quack remedies on the market, Warner's Safe Diabetes Cure, um, despite its claimers, it was in fact mostly alcohol, uh, did have a certain effect, I suppose. Uh, but complete and cruel hoax on these poor sick people. Nothing seemed to work. Well, actually, um, the physicians did find out that um, diet could have effects uh, if people with diabetes weren't metabolizing normal amounts of food. Perhaps they could, you could give them less food, give them as much as they could metabolize, as much as they could take without showing a high concentration of sugar in their urine or their blood. And, and so people with diabetes were put on di diets, what was called the dietetic approach to the disease. Older type 2 late onset diabetics, uh, diet can be an effective therapy if you can persuade people to stay on their diets um, and it's still a preferred therapy for the type 1 or juvenile diabetics the dietary approach wasn't adequate uh, their pancreases had failed so completely that the amount of food they were permitted on their diets uh, was usually not enough to maintain bodily weight and so the dieting caused them gradually to lose weight and take on the appearance of this boy is in a ghastly race, one he cannot win, between quick death from diabetes or adherence to a starvation regimen that will cause him slowly to starve to death. With luck, the starvation will buy him an extra year or two of life, but he's under a sentence of certain and painful death. Don't know a lot about that boy. I will tell you a lot about the little girl on the right, Elizabeth Hughes, sitting on the knee of her father, Charles Evans Hughes, a very great figure in your country's political. Christine, he narrowly lost the presidency to Woodrow Wilson. 
Later, he became a distinguished Chief Justice of your Supreme Court. In 1920, he was serving as Secretary of State under Warren Harding. Elizabeth, his youngest child, was born in 1907, diagnosed as diabetic late in 1918 when she was 11 years old. She was taken to the world's leading expert in the undernutrition therapy, a Dr. Frederick Allen of Morristown, New Jersey, uh, and put on a special Allen diet. It averaged between a sheep 800 and 1200 calories a day. The seventh day, they called the fast day and cut the patients back to 350 calories. Every single gram of food that Elizabeth ate was weighed in advance. Sweets and bread disappeared from her diet. Uh, in those days, they ate things like bran rusks that were apparently, uh, that tasted like sawdust we had because they had sawdust in them, and uh, vegetables that were boiled three separate times, thrice boiled vegetables to get the calories out of them. And I suppose Elizabeth's 13th birthday cake was a hat box covered in pink and white paper. You think it's difficult to get people to follow advice and to stay on diets today. Imagine what it was like to deliberately try to starve patients to death. Uh, Frederick Allen is a tough guy in that picture. He was a stern man. He got into debates with his associates about how far you could go in denying food to people. Could you imprison patients to stop them from getting anything to, uh, to try to alleviate their hunger? Stories of diabetics burning their hands to steal hot food from ovens, eating toothpaste or birdseed left in their rooms. Often, the patients or their parents just gave up thinking that nothing could be worse than the starvation and so they broke their diets and they died more quickly. Dr. Allen argued that it was a more painful death and you should never give up. Um, but at least they died with something like a full stomach. Elizabeth Hughes was unusually good at maintaining her diet. Turkey and succumbed and snitched a piece of turkey skin and they caught her and balled her out and she never did it again. And her perfect adherence to longevity helps to explain, uh, I mean, her adherence to diet, rather, helps to explain her relative longevity compared to other patients. She would make friends at Dr. Allen's hospital one summer, and then she would be back the next summer, but her friends wouldn't be there. And in her case, uh, the odds were completely against any future. She gradually went downhill. She started dieting early. 75 pounds, fairly slim for a five foot tall little girl. Uh, by the spring of 1920, she had a controlled descent with some roller coaster periods. By the spring of 1921, she had shrunk down to 52 pounds. To keep her urine sugar free, the doctors were sometimes uh, cutting her back to 350 to 400 calories a day for weeks on end. Dr. Allen explained to the Hughes family that it was important for Elizabeth to hold on as long as possible. My research was going on on the pancreas and diabetes, and it was just possible that before she died, something might turn up. He said the same thing, thing to the parents of this boy, Jim Havens, who uh, lived in Rochester, New York. His father was a vice president of Eastman Kodak. Jim was the best, probably the best patient in the records of the starvation diet. He had um, and, and endured undernutrition treatment for six years since being diagnosed in 1915. By had to drop out of school, was hospitalized, and his family felt the end was near. Uh, Jim's father wrote, his condition is not such as to hold out any hope. And then research began offering hope. Suddenly in 1922, word came out of Toronto 
Canada of a team at the University of Toronto who were claiming that they had at last discovered the internal secretion of the pancreas, a substance researchers had been for 30 years, which they had hoped would be the key to the body's ability to metabolize its food. The Toronto team had made extracts of animal pancreas, which they gave first to diabetic dogs and then diabetic humans with remarkable results. The extracts contain an active principle that wiped out most of the symptoms of diabetes, enabling the recipients to stay alive almost indefinitely. The Canadian team called the active principle of their extract insulin after the islet cells in the pancreas were it wasn't a cure and the press still has problems every now and then understanding this uh, but it seems to return people with diabetes to normal lives I won't say a lot about the discovery of insulin itself I commend to you my very long and detailed book uh, I will say that it's wrong to attribute the discovery simply to the people whose names are most familiar to you, Banning and Best. You've all seen the famous shot of Banning and Best. Uh, that shot is always, almost... 21. It wasn't the first dog, and none of their dogs had names. It wasn't Marjorie. Uh, that was a picture that was posed about April 1922 and um, uh, often sort of backdated uh, because of a controversy that I'll uh, talk about very briefly. I conclude in the discovery of insulin that there were four discoveries of insulin, uh, Banning and Best at the top, the supervisor of the research, J.J. and a biochemist, J.B. Collip, at the bottom right. That clipping from 1922 has a very poignant title, Have They Robbed Diabetes of Its Terror? Uh, in 1923, the Nobel Committee in Stockholm honored the discovery of insulin with the fastest award of a Nobel Prize in, the his in history. Uh, it was not given to Banning and Best. It was given to Banning and McLeod. Banning announced that something was wrong. And he was splitting his prize money equally with Best. McLeod announced that he was splitting his prize money equally with Collip. And so you had two names on the Nobel Prize, uh, a four-way division of the money. And actually, two Nobel laureates who didn't speak to each other for reasons I'll show you in a minute. People wondered how the discovery of insulin had emerged in frozen Canada. Uh, the reason is that frozen Toronto is no more frozen in the winter than Minneapolis. And uh, the University of Toronto, which has a history not unlike the University of Minnesota, uh, was then uh, a great research university in which this research team was given all the resources they needed. The University of Toronto, in fact, was the first place that staged an all-out attack on the problem of the pancreas, pouring expertise and, and money and dogs into the problem until they got a resolution. Um, I've, I've mentioned dogs, insulin research. They, uh, of course, most researchers use mice. Comical similarities of the pancreas. That's uh, banning in actually in both pictures, um, and uh, that's best best successor. Uh, the person who worked with banning after best, Sadie Garens, on uh, that picture on the right. Uh, she lived on, and I interviewed her at, at great length. She told me that um, when Dr. Banning hired her, he said, uh, well, I have to have an assistant, and we're short of money, so they told me to go and hire a woman. <laughs> the University of Toronto wasn't, didn't have all of the resources.
This is from the TV movie Glory Enough for All, which I hope some of you saw years ago when it was on Masterpiece Theatre and, and other places. And um, it was a brilliant, wonderful uh, popularization of my book, dramatization, but they absolutely captured the spirit and they didn't s um, muck it all up. Uh, you always fear that you'll that what film people are apt to do that they may decide that Banning and Best had to have a homosexual relation or, or, or if you're a Canadian you worry that where they think it should have happened but they didn't and that was uh, a wonderful popularization and um, I showed this slide because I was on the set when they were shooting that scene and the produ producer was telling me how much easier the dogs were to work with than the humans uh, because they would do what they were told. Um, a lot of dogs died over the years searching for the internal secretion of the pancreas. A lot of dogs died in Toronto and every other lab where they were looking for it. The antivivisectionists who uh, oppose... Uh, were around then and publishing broadsides uh, complaining about this uh, you know, uh, kill all these dogs and they still can't cure diabetes that kind of argument um, Banning and Best were not dog stealers, it's true though that they ran short of dogs and they ran, went out on the streets of Toronto and bought dogs, a dollar a dog, no questions asked um, the discovery of insulin was and still is one of the most powerful arguments we have of the anti-vivisectionists for insulin immediately led to spectacular demonstrations that the dogs were being sacrificed in absolutely the best cause here is the first patient to be treated with insulin effectively in Toronto in January of 1922. His name was Leonard Thompson. He was a charity case, 14 years old, on the, shrunk down to 65 pounds, and on the brink of death in Toronto General Hospital when clinicians began giving him the research team. 1922. I seem to be without a pointer here. This is really the only time I might need one and I can actually talk my way through that. You'll see the um, little injection. This is the sugar in Leonard Thompson's urine and you see the uh, injections of extract. The first injection of extract was given on January uh, 10th, 10th, January the 11th. Uh, and you see that the urinary sugar declined only very slightly. There was no change in his severe ketoacidosis and an abscess formed at the in, uh, site of the injection and so they discontinued uh, administration. Even though this was a dying patient, this stuff wasn't doing any good. But then you see they resume extract on the 23rd of January and they get spectacular results. The sugar virtually disappears from the urine. His blood sugar goes to normal. He's brighter and stronger. His ketones go away, and it's uh, time to celebrate because this is the visual record of the first successful treatment of a diabetic patient in the history of humanity. I've talked about controversies uh, over the discovery. The controversy is right here in this slide, and here it is. The first insulin used on a human in trials was Banning and Bess. Uh, it had worked sometimes, but not always on dogs. When tested on a human, it failed. The insulin that worked on Leonard Thompson was made by the biochemist Collip, who had just was a late addition to the research team, but was a wizard at uh, fiddling with tissues and making extracts. He was able to take Banning and Best crude extract and um, develop a process by which he could get enough toxic contaminants out of it that when it was used in the clinic on a human, it worked clearly and unambiguously. Unfortunately, the members of the research team had never much liked each other. Uh, Banting particularly was suspicious of virtually everybody he worked with, especially Professor McLeod. Uh, he didn't much like Collip either. They were working on 
uh, a life-saving substance, which uh, also they realized probably there was scientific immortality at stake. And in these 10 stays in January, the research team fell apart much like Canadian hockey players. When, Bant when Collip went into the lab on the night of January 23rd and said to Banting, I've got it, I know how to do it, it works. Banting said to him, how did you do it? Collip said, I don't think I'll tell you. <laughs> Led to this scene in the lab, this is a true story, although that's from Glory, but we have it in Banning's own words uh, and Bess's own words. And Bess talked about how he had to separate them or call it would have been seriously hurt. And we have a student's eye view of the discovery of insulin. Um, and that's an ongoing story that um, obviously affected the, the award of the Nobel Prize and the aftermath and actually lingers on in Toronto and, and other areas where Banning and Best tended to get undue credit. Collip and McLeod tended to be forgotten about. I think that was wrong, and I think that my work has tried to, to write the record of history, although it's still the case that every time we have an anniversary of the insulin in Toronto, we have the families uh, jostling for honor and glory. Uh, at the Nobel Prize dinner, a wise physician said in insulin, there's glory enough for all of them. It was too bad that they really didn't believe that, but um, the scientists have egos, I guess, like everybody else. And in a way, it doesn't matter. Who cares whether they liked each other or not? Who cares whether they behave like jerks? Um, the fact is that they'd made a great discovery. A very great discovery. And from Leonard Thompson's point of view, uh, what was really the key to everything was that they had insulin. No matter, it doesn't matter how they got it, they got it. Actually, the key to why insulin was discovered at that time in history probably was the people who had been gone before who had worked out techniques of doing quick serial blood sugars between 1910 and 1920. And once you had that chemistry available to you and you could trace the uh, effect of extracts on dogs on their blood sugars, it was just a matter of time before somebody, figured, somebody managed to purify it to give you insulin. The real problem they had in January 1922 was that they had something that was uh, astonishingly effective and they didn't have very much of it. Uh, and worse still, after a few weeks of administering insulin to a handful of diabetic patients, as Collip tried to increase his production, his batches simply failed to have any potency. And he tried his laboratory batches, and they didn't work either. It was a ghastly mess. Um, layman, to, to layman, I say, the problem for the for this biochemical extraction was like a master chef trying to recreate a, a delicate recipe time after time on a wood stove. You just have too many variables that you can't control. But it's an awful, awful situation. Uh, you've announced a discovery. People are flocking to, to Toronto to get it. Uh, and if they don't flock to Toronto, uh, the, the whole world is, is, is waiting for, uh, for you. A sick, desperately sick diabetic child in Saskatchewan writing to the doctor who cures diabetes, Toronto, and the post office now is delivering these to F Fred Banning. Um, you, what do you do? You put the patients back on their diets and hope that they can survive. One didn't make it, a little girl. Uh, and you desperately try to make insulin. In uh, April 1922, May, Dr. John R. Williams from Rochester came over to Toronto to plead with the Canadian team for extract that he might use to treat on his patient, Jim Havens, because Jim was at the end of his rope, 73 pounds, and in the words of his medical record, anxious to die and end his misery. Uh, 
Haven's case so impressed the Toronto group that it said, well, we don't have any, but if, when we, if, when we are able to make it again effectively, we'll give you priority. They did. On May 21st, 1922, uh, Jim Havens became the first person in the United States to receive insulin, smuggled actually across the border because of customs red tape. They wanted to, uh, to, uh, to bypass that. That uh, happens from time to time. Um, I wish I could say that Jim responded beautifully to insulin and came back life. It wasn't that simple. The stuff they got to him was terribly impure, and he had a pattern of reaction to it. Like, well, they had so little to go on. He, it was painful. He stayed alive, but only barely. And they fiddled with his dosage, and Banning went to Rochester, and, and it seemed just a, a terrible ongoing mess, and they couldn't figure out what to do. They could keep him living. And that was that. Um, in the meantime, they decided, the Toronto team decided it had to get help with insulin manufacture. Uh, a research director from Eli Lilly and Company had been present at one of the first presentations in 1920, late 1921, and had offered to uh, collaborate with the University of Toronto. Canadians are naturally suspicious of offers by big drug companies from the United States to collaborate. And the first plan had been to produce it ourselves with our own resources. Uh, we had a little uh, pharmaceutical lab. The fact is that we couldn't do it. And uh, by the end of May, when they had rediscovered the ability to produce little bits of it, they decided that they had to, had to get help, entered into a joint venture with Eli Lilly and company to share all um, patents and uh, uh, see if they could work together. In the meantime, I should have had this slide earlier. In the meantime, Elizabeth Hughes in Washington is nearing the end of her rope. Uh, her weight's below 50 pounds. Uh, her mother writes to McLeod in Toronto in June 1922 saying, telling him about Elizabeth, pleading uh, for her to be allowed to come to Toronto to get the miracle treatment, and she's refused because we don't have enough for our own patients. In the, by this time, uh, the drama has switched to Indianapolis where Lily is pouring resources into the manufacturing problem. You uh, go to the abattoir and get all the chilled beef and pork pancreas that you can, and then you put it in a big meat grinder and grind it up, and then you begin the extraction process. It's an important chapter in the history of Eli Lilly and company. They made important production breakthroughs. Um, by the summer of 1922, July, they were able to ship a potent insulin into Toronto. They branded it as Islatin, uh, where it enabled the Toronto team to keep its patients going and as new supplies came from Indianapolis to slightly expand the pool of patients who were being treated. Um, this is of course uh, helps to explain why my talks are often sponsored by Lilly. It's a great chapter in the history of their company, explains why they still sell a lot of, of uh, insulin today. Um, but they weren't the only insulin producers. Uh, insulin, I think, probably in the history of Eli Lilly and Company, was their, has been their most important product, with the possible exception of Prozac. Um, although it's interesting. It's interesting in all sorts of ways, because uh, insulin was effectively a generic product almost from the beginning. The patents really didn't matter very much. And it's an interesting example of how uh, you can establish dominance with generics that will take you a very long way. Uh, and there was also uh, other visitor. There were other visitors to Toronto. August Krog, a Danish Nobel laureate, came to Toronto in the autumn of 1922 and asked McLeod if he could be shown how to make insulin for the benefit of Danish diabetics. He was shown how he went back to Copenhagen, founded the Nordisk Insulin Lab, and um, from Nordisk, uh, was produced 
Novo, and then Novo swallowed up Nordisk, and uh, the Danes came to dominate the European insulin market just as thoroughly as uh, Lilly dominated the North American market. Uh, after August Krogh's widow died, his family found their house full of empty vials of insulin. And it turned out that one of the Danish diabetics he was trying to save by learning how to make insulin was his own wife, who had just become diabetic. Well, these are great stories for the pharmaceutical companies and in the history of um, uh, pharmaceuticals. But again, the really interesting story are the patients. Uh, back in Toronto, 85 years ago, August 1922, and with the increased supplies of insulin, they were finally able to bring Elizabeth Hughes to Toronto. She came up from Washington by train. Fred Banning examined her on August 16th, and this is her medical, from her medical record. Patient extremely emaciated, slight edema of ankles, skin dry and scaly, hair brittle and thin, abdomen prominent, shoulders drooped, muscles extremely wasted, subcutaneous tissues almost completely absorbed, scarcely able to walk on account of weakness, height 5 feet, weight 45 pounds. So what would you say, a week away from death by starvation? He began giving insulin to Elizabeth immediately. She wasn't cured of her diabetes. The uh, papers are always getting that wrong, but she responded beautifully. And we know what was happening to her because she was, had become over the years an expert at keeping her food records, and now she kept her insulin records, page after page. And here we have her on August uh, 20th. She's just starting to get injections. She records her injection, her reactions, her calorie intake. They had her on a high starvation diet of 1,100 calories a day to get her to Toronto. And then on the August uh, 25th, Fred Banning moves her up to 2,700 calories. Uh, and she notes ate a piece of white bread today for the first time in three and a half years. And we have all of her records. These, by the way, and all of her letters are on the internet. If you go Googling under discovery of insulin, you'll be led to a University of Toronto library site, which has 7,000 pages of the original insulin documents. Uh, maybe this is not. I'm, this may be one thing, but all of Elizabeth's letters are. And here on the 20. 9th or 30th, 31st, the insulin supply fails. They have none. They drop her right down to 920 calories. And then the next day, a new supply comes from Indianapolis, and you're able to keep going. By the end of that summer of 1922, uh, the results on the patients in Toronto were just wonderfully pleasing. Beautiful poster boy, little Ted Ryder, who had come to Toronto uh, a little bit before in Elizabeth in June, um, five years old, 27 pounds. Again, a, a medical uncle of his had come up from the States and pleaded with Banning to take him. And uh, the story was Banning had said, well, bring him back in two or three months. And the uncle said he won't be here to bring back into if we wait that long. So they took him, and there he is a year later, fattened up on insulin. From Fred Banning's scrapbook, Elsie Needham, in October 1922, she entered hospital for sick children in diabetic coma. She was the first child to recover from coma by the use of insulin. Before that, when they went into coma, you wrote them, effectively wrote them off, and now you gave them a needle, and they came back to life. And wasn't that amazing? I talked to the old doctor who first brought a diabetic child out of coma in Glasgow, Scotland in 1923, and he told me many years later how he had trouble getting in to see the staff of the, getting in to see the, his patient at the Royal Infirmary the next day because the whole staff of the hospital were lined up to see the miracle. Uh, we have, uh, we know a great deal about uh, the stories of these early patients, mostly because of Elizabeth's wonderful letters that she wrote on her little typewriter to her mother who was down in Washington, 
Elizabeth writes, I am simply bursting to see you and can hardly wait for you to see with your own eyes what I'm eating nowadays. For if you didn't, I declare you'd think it was a fairy tale. You will hardly know me as your weak, thin daughter. For I look entirely different, everybody says, and I can even see it myself. I am getting now what a normal girl of my age should, and I'm gaining every hour, it seems to me, in weight and strength. The best part of all my diet now is that I'm eating absolutely anything, including candy. Now, don't be shocked by that statement, for it is only on reactions when I have that privilege. But you see, it gets my blood sugar up to normal again as quickly as anything will, so Dr. Bang thought that as long as I was out a great deal, candy would be much easier to take. And so now my pockets are full of these little molasses kisses, you know, and when I have a reaction, I take just one, and I recover immediately. I take everything. Every day I eat bread or crackers for my two big meals, potatoes, rice, any kind of fruit, macaroni. It seems to me that I eat something every day that I haven't tasted for over three years, and you don't know how good it seems and how I appreciate every morsel I eat. I can't express my gratitude for the chance I'm having and being up here to take advantage of this wonderful discovery, for it is truly miraculous. By November 1922, the uh, clinicians were able to do what doctors always like doing, have a conference. Uh, everybody gathered in Toronto to compare uh, notes on the use of insulin, which had been given to a, a select number of clinicians by uh, Lily and they all signed the honor roll. That's Jim Haven's doctor, John R. Williams, and uh, my pointers died. Uh, then McLeod, fourth on the list is Jocelyn, sixth on the list is Frederick Allen, a uh, number of people from Indianapolis, and right down at the very bottom, best, Joe Gilchrist, and at, you can't see at the bottom is Fred Banning's signature. After that morning together, Banning took the elite group of doctors to see his prized patient, Elizabeth Hughes, and we have Elizabeth's description of that meeting written to her mother. Well, she writes, all the doctors came at last, just as about we were about to sit down to lunch, the way I just had a feeling they would. She didn't much like doctors by this time. Uh, remember that picture of Dr. Allen. There were six of them, and they all stood in the door and just stared at me until I got so nervous I didn't know what to do. It seems to me that every time I looked up, I met the eye of one of theirs fixed on me. It was terrible. There were Dr. Jocelyn, Dr. Allen, Dr. Banning, Dr. Fletcher, Dr. Widget, and Mr. Best. Dr. Allen acted nicer than I'd ever seen him. And Dr. Jocelyn was simply adorable. No wonder everybody is crazy over him. These two were ushered in first, and Dr. Allen said with his mouth wide open, oh, and that's all he did. He just kept saying over and over again that he had never seen such a great change in anyone. And he actually cracked a joke as he was leaving, saying he was glad to have been introduced to me or he wouldn't have known who it was. Now, I think that's very good for him. He's grown very fat, but his nose hasn't filled out any, unfortunately, and it's as flat as ever. You know, you never know quite what the patients are saying. <laughs> he, on the whole, he conducted himself so much better than I ever thought he would that everything went off beautifully. And Dr. Jocelyn is the sweetest man. All he could do was to look over at me and smile and say that he never saw anybody with diabetes look so well. Uh, even today, uh, Learning to take insulin is, and taking it isn't always the most pleasant process. Um, that's Elizabeth back home uh, in Washington. Before she went back, she described, she's at the ballpark, she described what it was like to take insulin in that autumn of 1922. Imagine, I have to take five cc's at a time. Isn't that awful? But it seems they've had no extract for the last few days, and I... I suppose we're lucky to have even this poor stuff. We only have a 2cc syringe. And so Blanche, her nurse, a special private nurse, fills it from the needle, which is left sticking into me. I feel like a pincushion. 
She fills it again and gives me that. I'm left a pin cushion once more and then have the fifth CC. It really is quite a process. It altogether takes about 20 minutes for the whole performance. My hip feels as if it would burst too, but it doesn't, although my whole leg is numb until I walk on it a bit. Then it recovers rapidly, and within an hour, I would hardly know anything had been given. Uh, this, uh, this slide is really jumping ahead, because um, in those days, she still had no flesh on her body, and her hips, uh, she said, were just a mass of swollen lumps and bruises from her insulin in, in injections. But she always added that she could endure anything for the sake of her new diet and what it was doing for her. I want, if you can possibly find them, the links that were taken out of my little silver watch and my gold bracelet. My arm is fattening out so much, you will be glad to hear that my watch is really becoming quite uncomfortable. So I need another link put in. And I saved them just for this special emergency. Although I must say, I didn't ever expect it to come. Of course, you see from that picture and this that she had a kind of rebound weight gain uh, after that kind of starvation you really did fatten up a little bit of course in those days your doctors or your nurses gave the patients insulin and then we have this letter from Elizabeth's to her mother Dr. Banning came in yesterday morning and he stated how he'd gotten a letter from Mrs. Whitehill the mother of one of the patients who had just gone home and how she had said that wonder of all wonders, little eight-year-old Ruth was giving herself her own injections. Well, that was too much altogether for me. I was not going to be in any way outdone by a mere girl of eight. Whereupon I made the bold resolve to give it to myself for the first time, doing absolutely everything. I did. I can do it perfectly beautifully, and it doesn't hurt me as much as anyone else giving it to me. For I know just when it hurts and just when to give more and stop and so on. It really is a wonderful thing to be able to do. And now I feel so absolutely independent. And then she pleads to be allowed to get rid of her nurse uh, and lead a normal life. And there she is back at the ballpark leading a normal life. And that letter is a description of a remarkable revolution in, in uh, therapeutics in the history of medicine. Elizabeth's story was quite marvelous and when they did glory enough for all this little Canadian girl was the actor in Elizabeth is uh, story is told in parallel to the research story. Uh, Jim Havens was off stage in Rochester and he continued to have terrible problems um, and finally they, after several months of struggle, they realized that he was allergic to pork insulin. First time they'd seen that. And when they got some purified beef insulin to Havens, he too came back to life. And here is the boy who wanted to die up on skis in 1924. And uh, about that time, he wrote this letter to Fred Banting. A little while ago, we celebrated a feast day here in the USA called Thanksgiving. I've celebrated a lot of fast days in the last few years. It's been some time since I've celebrated a Thanksgiving day. A week ago last Thursday, however, marked an historical event as I then tasted my first egg on toast. Egg on toast is my idea of the only food necessary in heaven. Dad and Dr. Williams group, group, grouped themselves around me in a half circle and watched. If it keeps on, I'll puff up with good spirits and burst. Spirits are forbidden over here, but insulin is within the law and yet has all the kick of the stuff Dad has hidden somewhere Prohibition doesn't know about. <laughs> Dr. Williams at that time wrote of Jim's revival. The restoration of this patient to his present state of health is an achievement difficult to record in temperate language. Few recoveries from impending death more dramatic than this have ever been witnessed by a physician. Well, what happened to those early patients? As an historian, I wanted to know. The first boy, Leonard Thompson, lived till 1935. 
uh, dying of influenza and his diabetes. He wasn't well controlled. He liked to go out drinking on weekends, and that wasn't good for him. And on the 10th anniversary of having his life saved by insulin, he really tied one on and was brought into Toronto General in coma and brought back out again. Um, died in 1935. I, we have his pancreas at the University of Toronto still. We put it tastefully on display from time to time. <laughs> Wondering about Jim Havens, and I called information in Rochester one night and w was soon found myself talking to his children. Uh, Jim Havens had gone on to marry and have children. He became an artist specializing in woodcuts. That's a self-portrait of Jim Havens done in the late 1940s. He was really quite good. He had more than his share of illness, but uh, 38 years on insulin, 38 years after his parents had given up hope and he wanted to die. N died of cancer in 1960. Elsie Needham, we could trace through her medical records in Toronto uh, for 24 years until 1946, and then we lose her. We have no idea what happened to her. I uh, would like to hope that she uh, moved to Minnesota, and uh, one of you will come up and tell me that that was Aunt Elsie. Uh, and if you think that that's uh, far-fetched, I should tell you that uh, there is another, in the files in Toronto, there is another patient who was from this part of the world. I think her name was Geneva Stickelberger. Um, some of you may have heard of her. She became a long-lived patient. And I think I've got this right. No, I'm sorry. Geneva Stickelberger was your patient from this part of the world, and she lived a very long and full life. There's another patient, Myra Blaustein, uh, about whom we knew nothing. And about three years ago, I learned that that Myra Blaustein's granddaughter is Lois Janovich, the medical director of the Sansom Institute in Santa Barbara, and uh, a very, herself, diabetic for many years, and of course, a very active figure in diabetes, and we had a great time talking about this out in Santa Barbara. Elizabeth Hughes, um, the last item in her file in Banning's papers was this clipping, which is her engagement announcement in 1929. Note that she's slimmed down and is exercising a beautiful young woman. Uh, I wanted to know what happened to her uh, above all, and uh, I thought that this young lawyer she was marrying might still be alive, and I found him listed in who's who. He was a vice president of Ford's. Um, so I wrote him in 1980 asking about the later course of his wife's diabetes and the situation surrounding her death. And here's the answering letter. Dear Professor Bliss, your letter of August 7th addressed to my husband <laughs> was read with interest by both of us. <laughs> Day after tomorrow will be my 73rd birthday and 58 years since I celebrated my 15th, having just arrived in Toronto to be Dr. Banning's third patient in a last minute effort to save my life. I gather I am one of the very few juvenile diabetics still alive and I have no idea why, except that I am physically strong and through, and she goes on to say, and through the years have enjoyed exercise and have not, and have uh, been a very careful eater. Uh, that was an amazing, wonderful letter to get and I was on the phone to her right away can I come and interview you for my book and she said I'm sorry we're just about to go out the door to China we'll be back again in six months there she is back from China blouse from China uh, no complications after uh, 58 years on insulin that's her 50th wedding picture um, three children born by cesarean which even with insulin, Di insulin isn't your your everyday birth. No more diabetes in the family. Um, actually, though, a difficult interview we had together because Elizabeth said, "Dr. Bliss, I plead with you not to give me publicity. Uh, I am a very private person. I uh, remember my years before insulin as a nightmare." 
and when i got insulin i could return to normality and part of being normal was that nobody knew i had diabetes i said this is i said look you're a famous person i've got the clippings about you she said that was a long time ago uh and if anybody raises it i say that was my sister catherine who was dead uh i said your father's papers are in the library of congress she said i put them there and i went through them and there are no references in them to my diabetes uh she only told her children she was diabetic uh when they became 18 and uh at se- sessions at lily we had uh the woman on the left antoinette uh come and talk about what it was like growing up with elizabeth and how every uh she seemed to certainly be a disciplined eater and every night at 5:30 she would go into her bedroom for a few minutes uh and only later did they realize she was taking her insulin um elizabeth told me that after her death i would be free to write about her and she gave me the letters she'd written her mother and um one of the phrases in those letters forms a chapter title in the discovery of insulin when elizabeth exclaims mommy this is unspeakably wonderful Elizabeth Evans Hughes Gossett died about 6 months after that picture was taken. She died in April 1981 uh of coronary problems uh, obviously exacerbated by her diabetes. She had a wonderful life. She told me that little Ted Ryder whom she'd known in Toronto was dead and I did no follow up. And I published the discovery of insulin in 1982 and in 1983 gave a lecture like this at Yale. And afterwards a physician came up to me and said, "Well, we've got this old man named Ryder up in Hartford, Connecticut." <laughs> and I was astounded, astounded. Uh Ted Ryder had not died. Elizabeth was wrong. I should have kept looking. Uh here that is Ted in my living room in Toronto in 1990. Uh Ted was back in Toronto then. because he was helping us celebrate um a historical plaque in our medical building to the discovery of insulin ted was the complete opposite of elizabeth he loved publicity and um uh, it it he thought it was terrific that somebody had finally found him uh here he is when he came to toronto that's my home f- f- snapshots my three teen then three teenagers who were ordered to come to dinner that night to meet Ted uh and all photographed with Ted because of course they'll tell their grandchildren about meeting one of the original patients and this is the unveiling of our plaque uh at which we had the before and after pictures and we had an original patient 68 years later and that was a really moving occasion i i noticed that even the the hardened physicians were moved by it. bernie zinman some of you know uh bernie is not hardened in any case but he's a great fellow and um one of our best diabetologists this is ted looking at the bust of banning in our medical building uh, on that occasion and this is a later slide from lily's uh lily Ted went to Indianapolis and they fetted him there and they always like to talk about Ted as their best customer 60,000 injections and counting and um uh, they didn't talk about how many of the patients some of you will remember in those er- days in the early 80s Ted and Elizabeth both grumbled about uh, these new fangled insulins and Ted particularly didn't want to go on humulin but I guess he had to make the transition um Ted like Elizabeth was a well controlled diabetic both of them had a good genetic legacy in Ted's case the evidence is that the woman in this 1983 picture is not his wife but is his mother uh Mrs Ryder was 93 and came for, out from her nursing home for the day as we interviewed Ted and uh, she was Ted Ted's only memories of his starvation time were of uh keeping scrapbooks and cutting out pictures of food um 
Mrs. Ryder remembered having Ted in her arms on the platform of Grand Central Station and overheard the neighbors say, I don't know why they're taking that poor sick child up to Canada. You know, they won't bring him back. And she was a very proud mother, very proud, very protective. She had, well, I know, I know that she gave Ted his own insulin injections until he was 16. Um, and, and Ted made a point of telling me privately that the happiest times in his life had been when he'd gone on long cruises by himself. Um, he, there was, and the, the last thing we heard from Mrs. Ryder is Ted was showing us to the car was Ted put your sweater on. And Mrs. Ryder, Mrs. Ryder lived to 95 and after she died, Ted had his first romance and when he came to Toronto, he brought his girlfriend with him. They, she was a nurse and they'd fallen in love in their retirement home and they were very much in love. Uh, Ted, as I say, was celebrated. The ADA uh, honored him. They made a coloring book uh, about him. In July 1992, Ted became the first human to survive 70 years on insulin. In 1993, he died of old age uh, and diabetic complications. What an extraordinary life he had had. About four years later, I got a call from the office of the Dean of Medicine saying, we want, would like you to know that we've just received uh, a grant, the residue of Mr. Ryder's estate, some $60,000 that's left over that he wants to be spent on medical research at the University of Toronto. I said maybe it should be spent on medical history at the University of Toronto, but, but no. The longevity story continued after Ted and Elizabeth had gone. There were no more original patients, but in Scotland, Sam Davidson had been on insulin since 1923, so he'd had 73 years. Uh, and uh, uh, 1996 was the 75th anniversary, and I saw a number. I also saw a, a Danish woman who had been on insulin 73 years. And of course, that story continues now. We're an on for another decade. And there are patients in the United States, a handful, who've been on insulin for more than 80 years and counting. And we can take book on uh, how many uh, years Kathy and people like her are going to go on insulin. The first 50 is just the beginning nowadays. Uh, but those are, of course, the best kind of longevity stories, and they're an inspiration I've found to people with diabetes everywhere. Last patient, Paula Ng, daughter of Dean Ng of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England. Beautiful living doll. In 1921, at age nine, she became diabetic. They put, the British were operating about 18 months behind North America in developing insulin. And uh, in the spring of 1923, there was still not enough good insulin to treat Paula, she'd been on the starvation diet and she died. She died at a time when hundreds of children were being maintained in North America. It's wrong to think that the, without the Toronto group there would be no insulin. It would have happened. Uh, it might have come later and maybe Lily and the other drug companies would be different today and they wouldn't have had that wonderful launch in 1923. But for the children we've been talking about, Paul Ng, Jim Havens, Elizabeth Hughes, Leonard Thompson, Ted Ryder, Elsie Needham, the exact timing of the Toronto research made all the difference. Except for Paula, these children experienced a reprieve from death almost without precedent in the history of medicine. One as visually and emotionally and spiritually as spectacular as we can imagine. Two of the children who nearly starved to death Ted Ryder and Elizabeth Hughes outlived every one of the discoverers of insulin. This, and of course, it's an ongoing story. It's an ongoing story for your patients, for you, uh, and uh, you're the heirs of these people. You're the next generations as you carry on a story that's now a story of the quality of life 
and not the speed of death. And uh, the quality of life gets better and better slowly, and the researchers keep on working also, alas, slowly towards a cure. The shrewdest observer of all of these events was Elliot Jocelyn, the great diabetes doctor in Boston, who saw more clearly than anybody else that there was a job still to be done. And whereas Alan and even the Toronto people closed their clinics, Jocelyn kept his going because he said that people have to learn to live with insulin and there's going to be a new era now and there are going to be complications and we have to cope with it. But Jocelyn also was more eloquent than anyone in talking about the events that he'd witnessed in these years. Uh, by Christmas of 1922, Elliot Jocelyn wrote, I had witnessed so many near resurrections that I realized I was act seeing and acted before my very eyes Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones... And lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. And said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, and say, uh, say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great arm. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to tell this story another time. Thank you so much.